Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand, stand against the wiles of the devil. <clears throat> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and uh, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and have, uh, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye, may be, uh, ye, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery, uh, fiery darts of the devil, or the, of the wicked, <coughs> Thought I was going to be able to make it without one tonight, but I, apparently I'm not going to. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your Spirit tonight. That, Lord, as we talk about the uh, armor of God, Lord, that you would remind us in each and area, each area in each piece of armor, of how it reflects, you know, the, the life that we should live, according to Your Word. And Lord, I ask that You would give us here to hear, and that the seed of Your Word would fall upon fertile soil upon our hearts. God, that You would change us and transform us into Your image. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, uh, we've been studying obviously the different pieces of the armor of God. The armor of God is obviously a necessary tool in our fight against our common en uh, enemy, the devil. Without every uh, uh, piece of armor in place, we are easy prey for the enemy. When the, the pieces of the armor are missing, Satan has little trouble in defeating us. He has little trouble damaging our testimonies, infiltrating our churches, and devastating our, uh, de sorry, de uh, infiltrating our churches and devastating our church. When the armor is missing, we are easily defeated. Yet when a saint of God is dressed in the whole armor of God, the enemy has, a hard, time, has hard times dealing with us. When the armor is in place, he cannot penetrate those defenses, and he must watch helplessly as they stand for God's glory after the victorious day. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of testimony I want to have, is that I put on the full armor of God every day that I wake up. So let's continue uh, looking at those full, uh, the full armor of God, knowing what they are and how to use them will help us to stand for the Lord in victory. Now, as we see here in, in verse 14, it talks about the belt of truth or the fact that, you know, that, that it says in verse 14, the beginning part of it, it says, having your loins girt about with truth, that, you know, uh, the uh, having your loins girt about, you, you know, it, it's a belt that they're referring to. And this refers to a life of total commitment to the Lord. It refers to a life that is built upon the faithfulness of uh, the Word of God and to the God of the Word. It speaks of the truth of uh, truth and text, uh, testimony and truth in living. This belt of truth will provide the Christian soldier stability, and it also provides a place for uh, the other pieces of the armor to rest. Without the belt of truth, the soldier will find the other pieces of the armor useless. And as we continue tonight to look at that spiritual, uh, the spiritual filled, the spirit filled warfare, we're going to continue that you know, by looking tonight. We're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is, is the second piece that, that is mentioned. That breastplate is a sleeveless piece of armor that goes over. And it covers the full torso. It goes all the way from up here down, you know, down to your waist. It covers that whole entire area. No Roman soldier would ever go into battle or would dare to go into battle without the breastplate, that breastplate in place. There were several way, uh, ways to make breastplates in that day. Some were made of heavy pieces of leather. This leather was shaped to fit the upper body. The breastplate was then covered with over, uh, overlapping slices of animal hooves, horns, or pieces of metal. That's how they would get the armor on there. They would have the leather, and then they would put those pieces on over top of it as a way to do it. Some 
Other ones were made of very thin pieces of linen cloth. And you think, how thick can they be? Well, this, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, uh, kind of breastplate was also covered with the same thing. It was covered with the strips of hooves, horns, or metal. It doesn't really seem like the best one, but it's probably the one that's able to breathe the best. As far as if you're in you know, warm weather, uh, it'll breathe you know, uh, good for you to where you're not sweating constantly or whatever and get that one. Now, the third kind is kind of the one that I would prefer since I'm kind of, a, you know, I'm allergic to pain. I'm not really a fan of pain, but it, it's made of large pieces of metal that were hammered to fit the body. They hammered out this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this big piece of metal to fit the body, and regardless of the kind of breastplate that the soldier wore, the intent was the same. Is that breastplate, no matter which way you look at it, was to do what? protect the vital organs in this area. And these are obviously the area, the area that has the most, you know, uh, different, that, that has the, uh, the most vital organs that are in there. It's obviously uh, there to protect the heart, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, all of those organs. And in, the age, in an age before antibiotics and advanced uh, surgery techniques, a wound in that part of the body would not only be very painful, but it would also possibly be fatal. So many times you hear of, of those, uh, you know, just back in, say, Civil War times, not even the times where they're using swords and shields, but they get shot, you know, with a lead bullet. What ends up happening? They end up getting gangrene or anything else because they don't have anything to fight against, you know, uh, infection um, at that time uh, that they would use. So the soldier depended on the, uh, that breastplate to protect them from injury and death. They didn't want something around that, you know, just because, I mean, there may have been ones that said, you know what, I don't care if it's 107 degrees. I'm going to wear that leather. I'm going to wear that metal because I don't want to get, you know, stabbed or shot or anything else. I don't want to wear the linen cloth one and have that possibility. All right? So, but the spiritual significance of this piece of armor becomes clear when you stop to remember that the ancient world believed that the heart represented the will and the mind of the person. That the heart represented the will and the mind of the person. They also believed that the bowels, or what we would call the internal organs or the guts, represented the seat of the emotions or feelings. So you have the heart that represents the mind and the will of the person, and the bowels or the guts of the person represents the seat of the emotions or feelings. So when we look at that, you know, there's uh, several uh, verses in the New Testament that, uh, that bring this, you know, out. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, For God is my, uh, my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Christ. What is he saying? How greatly I long after you uh, all in what? You know, uh, the fact that the seed of the emotions of Christ. So he just longs for them, you know, uh, in that loving way. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation uh, in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy. So he's, he's referring to the seat of the emotions again and the feelings. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. We also see this in uh, Philemon, uh, verse 7, 12, and, and 20, and also in John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. And so when we're seeing these things, uh, talking about the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, that is what that area is covering at that time period. That breastplate is covering the heart, it's covering the bowels, it's covering those things. You know, the heart is covering the will of, and the mind of Christ, or sorry, the will and the mind of the person, and the emotions and the feelings of that person with the bowels. That's what it is referring to. So we still use the same terminology regarding the heart. We say, uh, we say things like, I love you with all of my heart. Right? Or I feel it in my heart. Or put your heart into it. All those things. What does that mean? You're putting your will into it. You're putting your mind into it. You're saying, you know what? I'm going to do everything that I can, you know, uh, you know, for this. So, what we actually mean is that we uh, we have a feeling about something. 
so we can understand the terminology. So when we're talking about the breastplate, this is the area he's referring to. He's referring to the fact of talking about protecting the will and the mind of the person and their feelings and their emotions and those things as well. Because we know that the heart is deceitfully wicked among all things, and so we know that if the devil can take the heart, he can take the person, right? So the Roman, uh, the, sorry, the reason uh, I mention all of this is that just as the breastplate of the ancient uh, Roman soldier would protect his heart and bowels, and uh, the breastplate Paul mentions here is designed to do the very same thing for the child of God. The two areas of life where Satan most frequently attacks the people of God are the mind and the emotions. Too many people nowadays are definitely controlled by their emotions. They say, whatever I feel is right. And how many of you know that just because you feel some way or you feel another way doesn't mean that it's right? You know, somebody will say, I love you with all of my heart, and then they get married, and they're, and they're like, I, I, I love you. How many of you know that love is not a feeling? Because feelings fade, feelings change. There's times where you say, you know what, I'm having a really hard time being around you. But what love actually is, it's an action. It's, you know, it's a state of mind. You're saying, no matter what happens, I'm going to love this person. I'm staying with them. There's that action that no matter what, I'm going to be with them. I may not like them at times, but I'm there for the long haul. And not every, I know that there are, you know, there are, you know, I know that everybody's going to agree with that. They say, I, I, I have that feeling since, if you had that same, you know, that same feeling since you were 16 about the person you're married to and you've been married for a few years, the more power to you, but you know what? Feelings fade. So Satan will find, or sorry, will fill our mind with false doctrines and false emotions. I mean, you look at the news nowadays. I mean, I know that I, 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 that's you know, a go-to that I, I use all the time is the news. But they play off of people's emotions all the time. They're, you know, uh, they know what's going to trigger somebody just like that. They know if they say it a certain way, they know, what, you know which buttons they can push. And that's another way of saying that, you know, what feelings they can, you know, what they can say to get a you know, certain feeling out of certain people. Satan will use the wicked world around us to tempt us to think wrong thoughts and to follow wrong emotions. I mean, think about the fact of a person who's not saved or even maybe a person who is saved that is with an abusive person. How many times have you heard of a story or you've you've read something where a person is being abused, but they'll say, I still love this person? They're not good for them. But yet they'll say, I still love them. It's like, you know, no, you need to, you know, you need to get past the whole feeling thing and you need to go, oh, you know, this person's beating the tar out of me. Satan will use confusion to warp our thinking and feelings to cause, uh, cause to love the wrong things, follow the wrong priorities, and have wrong goals in life and dedicate, uh, dedicate ourselves to the wrong loyalties and to overcommit ourselves to the wrong things. We can oftentimes feel this way, especially you know, uh, like around church, because if we feel like we've been doing for something for so long, that if we feel that if we were to you know, step aside, that it's going to fall apart. So we have to keep doing it. Or something else opens up and we say, well, nobody else is doing it. I have to. No, you don't have to do it. That's one of the ways the devil you know, uh, likes to uh, burn out people, is that they feel like they have to do something. Like, no, you don't. Satan wants to strip the truth uh, from our minds while filling it with our own perverted ideas. Satan wants to stop us from uh, living holy, pure lives, so he, uh, so he will lure us toward envy, Hatred, greed, jealousy, immorality, and every other human vice that there is out there. I mean, he'll sit there and say, you know, it's only one time. It's not going to bother you. You know, if you just do this one time, it's okay. Or you have the thing of, you know what, I deserve this. 
There's a lot of times I've heard from people saying, I deserve this. Now, what you deserve is help. You know, honestly, if we, if we want to get down to the heart of the matter, you know, the whole thing is we deserve hell. But what he's going to tell you is that you deserve this. This is okay. You need to, you know, and you know that it's wrong. Oh, it's just one time. Nobody will see. Well, who's the one who does see everything? The Lord does. And that's who you're sinning against when you allow those things, you know, to happen. Satan wants, to ma- uh, wants us to make light of our sins, that it's not that bad. Everybody does it. He doesn't want us to confess. He doesn't want us to confess it and deal with it in God's way. He wants us to get desensitized to it. I mean, I think I remember uh, sharing with you, uh, there was one time where I said, you know what, I said, I'm just going to stop watching TV. Like, I decided to fast television, which is definitely not a bad idea. And you like fast you know, television for the rest of my life, however long you would have me. That, that might be a good idea. But there was one time where I remember, it was early on, I said, you know, I'm going to fast television for 30 days. And you think, well, that's not, you know, much, that's not a long time. Or some will say, how did you do it? I mean, how did you make it for, you know, for 30 days without TV? Actually, after a while, it got easy. But when I came back after 30 days, I came back and I watched, I turned back the same shows. I said, man, I said, when did they, add, you know, add all this sex and violence and cussing and swearing and, and all this other stuff? And I realized it's been there the entire time. I was just desensitized to it. I just got used to it. And I said, man, I said, I need to, you know, I need to change up, you know, stuff that I'm watching because I'm just over here just watching whatever on TV. Like I said, he wants, to, uh, he wants uh, us to get desensitized, uh, desensitized to it so that we, uh, we uh, come to look at wickedness as a, a way of life for us. He wants us to rationalize sin and not to seek the Lord for forgiveness. To accomplish these and other goals, Satan attacks us in the way we think and the way we feel. If he can cause us to think about things the wrong way, and follow feelings that are not uh, pleasing to the Lord, he can defeat us and drag us away from the Lord. He can uh, get us out of the fight all by changing how we think and we feel. And now to say all that, you know, because, you you know, some would say, well, you know, drag us away from the Lord. Well, obviously, if you're saved, you can't uh, can't lose your salvation, but what is it doing? It's causing you to backslide away from the Lord. One of the biggest examples of back, you know, being backslidden, I think, is King Saul. King Saul, you know, was, was God's anointed. God picked him. He was doing all, you know, he, he loved the Lord. And then what ended up happening? Jealousy started creeping in. Because he started doing the things that he was not you know, supposed to do. He started being envious of things and, and greedy and had all, he began to have all his hatred and all these things. And it, it ultimately led to his demise. The blessed prayer of righteousness offers protection against these attacks from, uh, of the devil. Uh, when this piece of armor is in place, Satan will not be able to attack us in those uh, places. This, uh, the blessed prayer pl- sounds very, uh, to me it sounds very important. Does it not? Amen. It sounds very important. So I'm going to tell you a few things, you know, uh, you know, that it's not. Okay. A few things that the breastplate of righteousness is not is this. It is not self-righteous. It is not self-righteous. It's not, you know, uh, self-righteousness is not true righteousness at all. What it is is actually one of the worst forms of sin imaginable. The self-righteous person believes their character and their legalistic behavior earns them favor uh, with the Lord. They think that if I keep on living this way, whatever, God's going to love me more than he loves you. I'm a better person than you are because I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing it. Now, some people will say when you follow the Bible, when actually uh, you're doing something because you feel convicted about it. And you say this, is, and you're not pushing it upon somebody. You say, you know what, I just don't, I, I don't want to smoke. Oh, well, you're just being legalistic. No, it's called the, you know, the fact that you're actually following the word of God. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that you're beginning, to, you, you push things on other people that are not even in the Bible. Like you shouldn't sit in comfortable chairs because that's too much comfortable for you know comfort for you. You should live a little painful life. Go get a wooden bench because the Lord will love you more. Like that kind of stuff. 
you know, stuff that's not even in the Bible, that's not even there, you know, they'll try and, but they'll try and say that this is the way the Lord would have you for, you know, you need to have a little suffering, so go, get, go sit on a hard wooden bench instead of these comfortable chairs, you know, kind of a thing. But uh, they believe that it is up to them to please the Lord and to earn, uh, earn him reward, uh, so, er, yeah, earn him a reward, so they clothe themselves in a cloak of self-righteousness. Here's the problem. A person that is self-righteous thinks that they're better than everybody else and that they, present, they possess a standard of living that appears to uh, be better than everybody else. I'm so much better than you because of this. I'm so much better because the Lord loves me more than you. You see a lot of this actually in, uh, you know, with the, with the television evangelists. Because they'll sit there and tell you about how, how, how the Lord has blessed them so much with their jet, with their mansion, with all these things. And you know what? If you don't, you know, uh, you don't give that offering, then you're not as good as I am, and you don't want the blessing. And you don't, that's all an error of self-righteousness. They're trying to push you know, their legalistic attitude upon you. I say, actually, I shouldn't even say legalistic. I say you know, heretical attitude you know, on you. A self-righteous person lives up to a standard that they create in their own minds. It's not the standard of the Lord. It's a standard that they have created in their own mind. It's saying, you know what, God loves me more because I do this. That's why, that's why when people say, you know, that there's a certain sin that, you know, well, this sin right here, this specific sin, you can lose your salvation. Do you ever notice that, you know, that a person who says that you can lose your salvation always gives you a, a, a sin that they don't deal with as to one that they... Uh, you know, that they say that you can lose your salvation. It's always the one that you don't deal with. It's never, you know, it's never, one. I mean, nobody ever says, you know, that, you know, that, well, you shouldn't steal. Or, you know, those kind of things. Or the fact of, like, you shouldn't commit adultery or anything else. All the while, while they're looking at somebody, you know, you're fantasizing about some, you know, person on, you know, the computer or something. But the whole thing is, is that what they believe is that if, if they can stop enough sin, if they can avoid enough evil, or if they can do enough good, God will be pleased with them and reward them accordingly. Have you ever heard of that, you know, with a television evangelist? If you do this, God's going to bless you. If you do this, if you give that offering, if you do this, or you heard even, you know, maybe pastors in the pulpit, Maybe from this pulpit before, you know, we've gotten here and said, you know what, if you do this, God's going to bless you. One of the churches that we were at before, uh, you know, this is, you know, when we're early on in ministry, didn't happen under the pastor, did not happen under the pastor that we were under. But people told us the pastors before uh, the pastor that we served under did this. Went up to the pulpit, or sorry, not to the pulpit, but to the communion table. And the man's wife got up there and, and slammed $100 down and said, God owes me, and he will give me back tenfold for this. I would have, you know, pardon, you know, pardon you know, for my, the idea in my mind. I said, you know, I wish the Lord would have struck her dead right there. Because he does not owe you anything. When they fail to realize that their self-righteousness provides the, uh, the enemy with a powerful tool, that, uh, that he can use to strangle out the life of uh, out the life the life out of their service for the Lord, they lose their joy. They have no real peace because they can never do or be enough. How many times have you heard somebody says, I used to you know, serve the Lord or whatever. And it's not the fact that they're serving the Lord. It was the fact that they, they thought by doing so many good things for them or being so self-righteous or anything else that, that they could make God happy. And when they realized it in their heart of hearts that they couldn't do enough, they left. Because they're never really saved in the first place. Or they got so distant, you know, or they were saved, and they got so disenfranchised that they said, I don't, I don't want to even go to church because, because their mind is not right. They think that they have to do so many good things in order for God to love them more. Let me tell you this. God loves you as much as he does now, as he will tomorrow, as he did yesterday, and forever. Why? Because his love is perfect. You know, the, here's, here's the sad part is that they wreck churches because they are slaves to a law of their own making, 
And because they know nothing of love and forgiveness and grace, they, they won't show love and, and forgiveness and grace to anybody else. If somebody else does it to them, they're like, you know what? They have no idea how to do it. The self-righteous person cannot grasp the truth that their righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags. They can't understand that their self-righteous, uh, self-righteous activity closes the door to God's blessing if they are saved and to his salvation if they are lost. Your self, self-righteousness is a dangerous spot to be because you think you're better than everybody else, in the, which in fact that you're not. Number two is what, uh, what it isn't. It, it isn't the imputed righteousness of Christ. The imputed righteousness of Christ. The Bible talks about the imputed righteousness of Christ. What does that mean? Is that the Bible says that we don't impute, you know, we don't get the, the imputation or, or, or of sin that we should deserve. In other words, we don't have the sin, you know, uh, you know, placed upon us after we're saved, right? Because who took that sin? Christ. So we are imputed with his righteousness, so his righteousness is upon us. We are clothed in his righteousness. When we trusted Jesus as uh, Lord and Savior, his righteousness, as I said, was imputed to us. God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him. It's impossible for us to put on that kind of righteousness because it has already been given to us in its fullness, and it's ours forever. Jesus doesn't take back his righteousness after he gives it to you. You know, as the old saying is, he's not an Indian giver. He doesn't get, you just take it back. I don't understand what I can, you know, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, you know, where did that saying even come from, Indian giver? I don't know that. But anyways, the imputed righteousness, uh, uh, righteousness is the very foundation of the Christian life. This righteousness allows us access to God. It opens the door of heaven to us. It protects us against the eternal fires of hell. But it does not protect us from the attacks of the enemy. On the contrary, since the devil knows that he cannot have us because we belong to Christ, he redoubles his efforts to defeat us in an attempt to discredit the Savior, the church, and the glory of God. What do I mean by that? He wants you to live uh, sinful as a Christian. So that way people will look at you and say, you know what? They're not even living for Christ. That's not what Jesus would. And you're going to have people that, you know, try and do that anyways, you know, in your life. But why give them more ammunition, you know, than what they need? Because people will come up to you anyways and be like, oh, you're not saved. I mean, you did this last week or you did this, whatever. I mean, they're going to come out and throw accusations at you anyways. But why give them, you know, like why actually give them a credible reason to discount what God has done in your life. The child of God is to walk in obedience uh, to God's word every day. That's what we're supposed to do. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse uh, 4, he showcases showcases, uh, human self-righteousness and practical righteousness. You'll flip over a few. If you're in Ephesians, Six, just flat, I'll flip over a couple more pages to three, uh, chapter 3, verse 4. And this is Paul. He's, in a, like I said, showcases the difference between human righteousness, human self-righteousness, and God's righteousness, practical righteousness. Verse 4, it says, Though I uh, might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man uh, thinketh that he hath whereof he, uh, he might trust in the flesh, I more. In other words, if you think you're, uh, you're better than I am, I have even more so to sit there and go off of. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching, uh, the right, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to, uh, to me, those I counted for loss, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency, uh, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, having, not, having, uh, not having my own righteousness, 
which is of the law, but that which is through, faith, uh, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and, uh, and the power of his resurrection, then the fellowship of his sufferings, being made uh, conformable unto his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either uh, were already perfect, but I follow after, if, uh, if that I may apprehend that for which I also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So what does he say? He says, you know what, all the stuff that I did, all the stuff that I could hang my hat on, all the righteous things that, I, you know, that, that everyone in this world would say that you've done, that they would say, you know what, this man is great. He says it's dung. It's manure compared to knowing Christ. He says all this stuff people could sit there and look at it and say, man, this guy's a righteous man. He's, he's one of the best. He's, and he says, you know what, it's dung. It's manure. He says, because you know what? I want to know Jesus. I want to, you know, I, I, I want to, you know, know him in his resurrection. I want to, you know, know him. I just want, I, I, I want to know him. He wants us to know that salvation is not based on, you know, what we've done, but on what we've been given in Christ. When the, the Lord saves us and brings us out of sin and the dead religion and, uh, into a new life in Christ, the imputed righteousness of Christ within is lived out in practical righteousness or the obedience to the Lord. That's what helps us live for the Lord, is his righteousness. If we lack the breastplate of righteousness, or lacking the breastplate of righteousness will rob you of spiritual joy. We've been talking about this a little bit on Sundays, haven't we? When we've been talking about basic Christian doctrines and everything else, we're talking about the, uh, for the past couple of weeks, we talked about being backslidden. And we see the fact that when a person is backslidden, what, what goes away? Their peace and their joy. And this is another way you know, that, you know, that we can backslide is the fact that we, we don't put these things in place because we're allowing the enemy to attack these different areas of our, of our lives. And here's the thing is, is that when we don't put this in place, it's not because somebody else did it. You say, well... Because some people say the devil made me do it. If you have kids around or you whatever, my, my brother made me do it. Or my sister or, you know, mom, dad, you made me do it. Grandpa, mom, grandma, you made me do it. But what it is is it's a direct result of unforsaken sin in our life. Many of the doubts and fears and griefs we carry around with us are not related to what others do or don't do. The things that we hold on to oftentimes is a result of us doing something that we should not be doing. It has nothing to do with somebody else. Majority of the time, the majority of the things we go through is because we did it to ourselves. You know, we could sit there and try and blame it on every, you know, everybody else. But when Satan finds that you know, chink in the armor in this area, he exploits it to the fullest and when he does, our joy, our peace, and the sense of spiritual well-being are the first casualties. Now think about it. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, what did he do? He killed Uriah. And he covered it up with a mountain of lies. And what ended up happening? He lost his joy in the process. We see this in Psalm 51, 12, that he asked for it back. Because in Psalm 51, 12, it says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold with and uphold me with thy free spirit. He says, restore it. He's asking for it back because he knew, he knew that all that stuff that he did, all those sins that he, all that sinning, all that sin that he did caused his peace and his joy to go away. He knew that all this backsliding and everything else that he did caused that to happen. And he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Please, Lord. That's what he's asking. Lacking the blessed plate of righteousness will rob you of your spiritual fruit. If you are uh, you're disobedient uh, to the word of God, you will be unfruitful in your work for the Lord. Did you know that? When we're not being obedient to what God has asked us to do through his word, we, we will be uh, unfruitful in, uh, in the work. Why? Because he wants us to realize, hey, you're being unfruitful. Something not, uh, must not be right. 
and he wants you to get it made right. So here's the, here's the recipe for a fruitfulness. John chapter 15, verse 5, it gives it to us. It says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We must, we must realize we're, you know, we must abide in him so that way we can be fruitful in ministry. We can be fruitful in the word, right? Fruitful in the work of the, of the Lord. When we serve the Lord out of a disobedient spirit, any achievements we seem to have will be nothing but empty skins with no fruit in. Well, they're not going to have any fruit in there. Why? Because it's not going to last. Lacking the breastplate of righteousness will rob you of your spiritual rewards. Without holiness and righteousness, a righteous uh, obedience to the word of God, nothing we do is pleasing to the Lord. We must realize this, that we are to be in Christ, right? We've got to be doing that. Thus, nothing we do in his name will be blessed. If we are you know, disobedient, we're out, outside of that, you know, we're backslidden, we're not you know, following those things, everything, you know, everything that we do in his name won't be blessed. It's not going to be blessed until we come back to that part and we say, you know what, I need to put that breastplate of righteousness on. I need to get that back in there. Everything we do while, while not wearing the breastplate of righteousness, the Bible says, will be burned up on the day of judgment. Lacking the, breast, the breastplate of righteousness dishonors God and brings reproach on, uh, upon his name and his glory. Our sin hinders the spread of the gospel. Our sin tells uh, the world that we are no different than them. We talked about this on Sunday. I'm not calling, you know, the Bible doesn't call. I, I, I should, you know, rephrase that from saying I'm not calling because I'm, I'm no one. The Bible calls for us to live a holy life. It's not calling us to live a perfect life. We can't be perfect. Let me get that you know, across because some people say, well, Pastor, it sounds like you're just talking about being perfect. I can't be perfect. I'm not saying be perfect. The Bible doesn't say that. I'm saying that because the Bible says we're not perfect. We talked about on Sunday about talking about the fact of like instant confession or instant rep uh, repentance, that when you know that you've done wrong, that you know that when you have sinned, that you immediately you know, confess it, ask God for forgiveness, and you repent of it. You don't let it linger. You don't let it linger because the longer you let it linger, the worse it gets and the, and, the, and the deeper you get in. Take care of it. Get it out of your life. When we sin, we open the door for Satan to attack us and hinder our effectiveness, uh, effectiveness for the Lord. That is why we must take up and put on the breastplate of righteousness. When we do, our thought life and emotional life are protected from the attacks of the enemy. I want you to consider the following verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It says this, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now think about that. We're talking about, you know, the mind and the emotions, right? Where, does, where do our imaginations come from? Your mind and your emotions. And he says, you know what, you need to cast those down. When you have a thought that you know is against God's word, don't sit there and give, you know, give it you know, a second thought. Say, you know what, Lord, I don't want to have that thought, you know, and you, 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 you put it, you, you take it, you bring it, on, uh, you bring it to captivity, that thought, and you give it to Christ, because you know what his word says. You, you, all of a sudden, you, you know, fear comes across you, and you're going, and, you know, the devil says, oh, you need to be really, really afraid, you need to be afraid, oh, you should fear, you know, it's the worst thing ever. In our minds, we should go, no, because I know 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's why we, know, we need to know God's word. When those things you know, come across, or, man, Lord, or the devil says, you know what, you should be really anxious. You should have a lot of anxiety about this. What does the Bible say? Cast all your anxiety, all your fears upon him, all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. 
Those are things that we should automatically try and do. And I'm not saying, you know, you're like, man, Pastor, you're just rattling those off. I, I, I looked these up. I, I had to look these up because the, the devil wants my mind, my emotions, just as much as he wants yours. And we need to, you know, find the verses and scriptures, you know, in the Bible that are going to help us in this area. Because the, uh, the enemy, if the, think about it, Jesus, when he was being tempted in the wilderness or in the desert, what did, what did uh, Satan do? Did he just use some random, you know, uh, talking points to try and tempt Jesus? No, he used the Bible. That's why we need to know about it. I mean, if the devil uses the Bible against Jesus, you know, the word, you know, he is the word. He's like using his own words, you know, against him. What makes us think that he's not going to do that to us? He will, and even more so, because, you know, he's like, hey, you know what? I know, you know, I know how Doug, you know, I know all Doug's, you know, little points that I can get in there. I know how Bobby is. I can go over here and get him in this area. But if we know the word of God, we're not going to be necessarily be perfect in this area, just so you know. But like I say, when we mess up, when we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, right? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The second verse I want us to give thought to real quick is, is uh, Philippians chapter 4, or verses 6 through 9. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, or be made known unto God. And the peace of God, that, uh, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things uh, which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And I end with this is, when we have on the breastplate of righteousness, we will live lives that are clean, pure, and that bring God, glo- uh, God glory. When we live out practical righteousness day by day, the enemy will find that his temptations will have no power over, uh, over us. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness are essential pieces of the whole armor of God. When they are in place, we are, on our, we are on our way to becoming a believer who is able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I want us to listen, uh, listen to the words of Paul. In Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, it says this, And that knowing the, t- uh, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering and in wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the, the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. So my question, you know, that we, you know, that I want us to ask ourselves, I say ask ourselves because it's, you know, it has nothing to do with me, but we should ask ourselves these questions. Are we wearing the, uh, the, breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness? Are we putting it on daily? Are we saying, Lord, you know what, I need you, you know, to protect my heart and my mind and my emotions. Are you living a clean, holy life for the glory of the Lord? And remember, not talking about perfection. But if there are sins to confess, bring them to God now, and He will forgive you of those sins. The Bible says, remember, as I stated earlier from 1 John 1 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've been catch around by the devil, do what you have to do to get clean. 
so the Lord can use your life for his glory. And maybe those ones that are, you know, are watching out, you know, at home as far as maybe the fact is that they're not even saved. And so they sit there and they wonder. And the devil's going to lie to you and say you can't come to him. But the Bible says that he will not turn you away, that he will in no wise cast you out. If you come to him, he's not going to turn you away. He's going to say, come to me. And so what we need to realize in this is that we need to, you know, to, to put the belt of truth on, the breastplate of righteousness. We need to begin to put these, uh, the armor of God on and say, Lord, protect me from you know, the wiles of the, en- uh, wiles of the devil, wiles of the enemy, right? 